Okay, so I'm going to switch in English because the next guest is coming from uh, far from. It's going to be connected online. It's Arthur Arsubanakit. is one of the main responsible in at Autodesk Research. That is a company, uh, a global leader in design and uh, making software technologies. Is the principal uh, of the research uh, department at Autodesk, and is going to talk to us about new tools. What what kind of research? They do about new tools and experiments that they do. And uh, these are the kind of experimentation to allow designers to work more creatively during their daily uh, workflow uh, in a more positive environment. Uh, we decided to invite him because one of the last projects in which he was involved, it was with the famous designer Philip Stark designing an AI uh, chair. And they were using uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, to design uh, the, the chair. So please welcome Arthur with his talk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me and see me and see the screen. Um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so my name is Arthur Harsavanikit, and uh, like was said, I, I work at Autodesk, uh, which is based here in San Francisco, California. And um, maybe some people in this audience have used our tools, but for those that don't know, we make software tools for the design and make industries. And, um, you know, everything from the building you're occupying now to the design and manufacturing of the transportation you use to get there, to the animation or editing of the movie you saw the other day, our tools have some role to play in the development of those creations, as well as a large role in the industry to make it easier to create and push the boundaries of what is possible to make. So I sit within the research department of Autodesk and our goal is to conduct research to move future technology ideas across the impossible and practical space and into the practical. And it's in this practical stage and forward on where we see these technologies offered in our software products to designers. And so generative design is one of those technologies that started in research and reached maturity to be offered into our product design and manufacturing tool called Fusion 360. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about generative design today by highlighting two industry applied projects that I've worked on where we've applied the capabilities of that tool. The first is with uh, French designer Philippe Stark and the other is with NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. And then I'm gonna end with some current developments in the field of machine learning that I think have exciting promise to be applied to the field of product design. Okay, so let's get into it. So I'm gonna start with the collaboration with uh, designer Philippe Stark and Italian furniture maker Cartel to create the world's first generally designed chair for the market. But before I get into that process of how we came uh, to arrive at that chair design, I'd like to rewind the clock a little bit and explain not just why we decided to work on a chair, but submit a proposal to you all on why the design community continues to design chairs and why it's become this dynamic object in design history. So you would think that from when chairs first appeared some 4,600 years ago as a symbol of status or royalty, uh, we would have made the most optimal design by now. In 1994, Herman Miller made the Aron chair, which is one of their most ergonomic chairs that adapted to any body type and posture. But when people stopped having personal offices and moved their workspaces around, the functional need to commit to one chair all day became irrelevant. And now we know one of the worst things you can do for your body is to sit in a chair all day. But the object's function at the time seems secondary to its ability to express something about the society that it's a part of, as well as, as, well as its uh, ability to create an expression for the individual who sits in it. And because of this ability to express the times and the individual, uh, designers continue to take on this design challenge of, of a chair. And it's quite a design challenge. Uh, pioneer modernist architect Mies van der Rohe once said, because of its problems and possibilities, it's almost easier to build a skyscraper than a chair. 
and Danish furniture master Hans Wagner spent his whole career in the pursuit of making the best chair. And while doing so, he set the stage for the 60s modernist movement in the field of furniture. At the height of his skill, he said, if you could just design one good chair in your life, but you simply cannot. He acknowledged that pursuing a definitive lasting chair was a futile endeavor. And eight years after Wagner made that statement, his chairs were chosen to be used for the first US televised presidential debates between Nixon and Kennedy. And 40 years after that event and five years before his passing, he said he still thinks he could have made it better. So uh, what drives better for these designers? In my opinion, it's these ever changing factors between needs and capabilities. These needs can be functional or user experience based and capabilities can be manufacturing and design centric. And from a larger perspective, these factors can be viewed as a negotiation between culture and technology. And that negotiation process is performed between a designer and the tools they use in the design process. Now, as far as new technology capabilities for design and manufacturing, generative design for us is leading the way, which is this new workflow of design where one sets up constraints and goals and algorithmically arrives at a multitude of design solutions, which a designer can then navigate through. Now, a key thing to note is that not only are all these solutions driven by computation and simulation analysis, it's also driven by the designer's ability to communicate the design problem in the initial setup. And it's this conversation between the designer and the algorithm or the tool where value can be found for design. Now, as far as designers exploring commu and communicating cultural needs in the field of product design today, Philippe Stark is among the most influential. And I think everyone here has heard of Stark, uh, who's been practicing for over 40 years in the field of product design, interior design, architecture, transportation, and even space tourism. His studio manages about 200 projects a year. And his design principles, as I know them, focus on using less material to create more efficient products, and in turn, what he considers to be more human products. I really like this, these quotes by him about design, where he says, the task of design is to try and make the daily obligations bearable so that we can love them. And by partnering with companies to mass produce his designs uh, in order to reduce cost, his mission throughout his career has been to democratize design and create well-designed objects that are not just exclusive for the upper tier incomes. Now, as far as chairs go, Stark has seen several dozen of his designs reach mass market production. In fact, his Louis Ghost chair has sold over 2 million copies since its release in 2002 making it one of the most bought chair designs in history. And for Stark, he's always asking about the question for better. So when he approached us, he said that after designing uh, dozens of chairs over the years, his outcome is pretty much the same because he said to us that his background and cultural structure does not allow him to do it so differently. And so he went on to tell us that he was creatively getting bored. You know, once, once we heard this, we our mission uh, was clear. We were going to use generative design as a tool to form a new creative starting point that didn't come from his initial biases on what a chair could be, which uh, would hopefully get him out of this creative ghetto in his words. So after we explained how uh, generative design worked, our design brief was formed. The question for better that we were pursuing with Stark was if we could find a solution to support the body with minimal materials. And so our process started by referencing his best chair designs to start with and uh, extracting the proper angles for comfort and ergonomics. From there, uh, we had the ideal minimal surfaces needed to contact the body. And our load cases were drawn from European standards uh, for testing safety and durability in furniture. Now, if the chair was to be sold in the market, we would have to pass these safety tests. So it made sense to, to drive the generative process from these loading scenarios. So once the setup was complete, we started generating. And here you can see the moving and removing of the material within generative design. The blue represents areas of low stress based on the material and the load cases we were using. And this is where the blue is, is where the materials can be removed. 
Um, and you can think of this process as analogous to the way our bones grow through evolution. In essence, we're using the same physics principles that drive evolution, only in this case, the evolution is sped up through simulation and computation. But that doesn't mean that we have evolved the perfect chair, since the system does not know at first what we intended to create the chair with. So one of the main research challenges when we were working on this project was to drive the generations towards manufacturability. Since manufacturing process we chose was injection molding polypropylene thermoplastic, we needed to arrive at a solution that had a relatively consistent wall thickness and in turn a, a certain level of simplicity for efficient mold investment. So we continue to iterate on our setup with every solution and many times put the solution back in the kind of generative oven. Uh, it's also at this point where our software engineers on the team began to solve for molding and casting constraints to the generative system and help drive the solutions towards a high level of manufacturability and feasibility. And since we tried not to influence the results too much, and just inputted the minimal surfaces needed for a chair, we knew we had to post-process our chosen generation results. So once we found the generation we knew we could work with, the Stark team took those results and adjusted the form to meet their proper ergonomics that have the signature curves that Stark's designs are known for. And I remember Stark saying that we're essentially looking for the most efficient chair architecture within the generative system uh, outputs. And for him, this was a language that was driven by nature and not culture. So after the team adjusted the design, we reran simulation to validate for safety and durability towards European uh, testing standards. Um, Cartel joined the collaboration to manufacture the chair. Now Cartel and Stark have worked uh, with each other for over many years on many of his design, uh, chair designs, including the, his famous uh, Louis Ghost chair. And leading up to the release of this chair, uh, cartel manufacturing engineers developed a workflow where they used uncontaminated production scraps from their other products in production to injection mold the chair. And I believe this is the first time in cartel's 70 year history of furniture production that they're producing a chair using 100% fully recycled materials. So, from this project, it's clear that the ability to use algorithms to arrive at a chair design is here, though it's still a journey with no quick answer and requires the designer to really drive towards that answer. And for us, we drove towards durability, manufacturability, and minimalism. And with Stark and Cartel arrived at a design that I think signals our time. Uh, but it's not going to be the last uh, be all end all of chairs. And uh, personally, I'm looking forward to the next the next iteration. So, um, speaking of next, I'm I'm going to transition to our work with NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab using generative design. So, this uh, you see here is one of the moons of Jupiter called Europa, and NASA JPL are thinking about how they could one day land there, some 365 million miles away. And on Europa, they believe they'll find oceans that contain over twice as much water as our oceans here on Earth. This was their original concept lander for the potential mission. And the proposed mission is not just to land on Europa, but to hold enough scientific equipment to search for signs of life. So we took on the task of collaborating with JPL uh, on the uh, lander's structure to reduce the weight to travel to that distance. The problem definition produced a variety of potential design solutions, each optimized to help determine manufacturability. And in this main structure, we had already reduced the weight of the lander by over a third, which is um, more than twice of what their traditional engineers were able to produce when they were taking on the same task. Um, and their engineers had to validate how that design performs. Now this part may look very bulky and thick, but it's actually hollow on uh, in its internal structure. The algorithm used a uh, variable wall thickness to efficiently distribute the stress loads of the rocket launch, which was the greatest load case we had to overcome. And so here you see the generation process. And any weight that we can save on the lander could instead be spent on more scientific equipment to hold. And less weight also means less rocket fuel. So lightweighting for NASA was a big deal. 
uh, as is the manufacturability. We had to push our algorithms to cover not just additive manufacturing, but machining and casting as well. So in the final assembly, the integrated uh, journal design combines industrial additive printing from a powder-based process uh, for the critical internal structure and then casting of the main external structure and five axis machining for the four structural legs. The internal structure is one of the most complex parts in the design as it's not only holding um, or not only accommodating a hardware assembly, but it's also adapting to the order of the assembly of the scientific equipment, uh, which is shown here as black boxes. So we're seeing all here all the structural parts optimized by the system and the kind of assembly steps. Uh, since the external structure was a little too large to metal print in a reliable way, we 3D printed the molds for sand casting the part in aluminum. Uh, here you can see our casting partners releasing the external structure out of the mold and quality testing the, the casting through CT scanning. As for the legs of the lander, we've written a new algorithm to encompass three and five axis machining, uh, taking generative design into uh, a realm that is very practical for NASA. Um, and so this machine manufacturing constraint is, is now in our tool today. Uh, and so from molding to, to milling to carbon fiber and casting, um, you can see the casted results of the external structure of the lander. Um, and ultimately the, this work on, uh, on the lander is to push our tools to explore manufacturability that allows JPL to avoid spending valuable cycles pursuing non-manufacturable outputs. And ultimately the goal uh, with gender design is to be able to explore the full design space. Just gonna move forward here. Uh, just a look at the, the lander structure fully assembled physically. Uh, so even though this was not a classic product design example, like a chair, I think it shows you the breadth of what this, this tool can achieve. And I'm going to move forward here and transition um, and touch on what we might be able to achieve in the field of AI with product design based on some new research in the last few years. And I believe you just heard about DALI2, uh, the recent development from OpenAI Lab uh, from the previous presenter, where they take text prompts and render an image of, of that text. So I think this is quite a powerful tool when we're thinking about style transfer between two concepts and how it might spark new ideas in the concept development stage. So take, for instance, this prompt given to Dali2, a photo of a Lamborghini in the style of a Honda Civic. And so if we change just one word, Honda Civic, to Ford Mustang, you can see the consistency, but also the novelness change. And now if you, you change the word to BMW, we get some pretty convincing results. And if we get away from cars as an output and give a prompt uh, that is a park bench in the style of Lamborghini, we also get some really great results, but not quite right in terms of furniture. And that might be because of its failing in shape recognition for 2D geometry, since Dolly 2's data set is based on images and the network relationships that, be, that can be recognized across these images. But if we look at where these ideas are progressing for 3D geometry, our AI lab at Autodesk Research is making really good progress here with a system we're calling ClipForge, where we're essentially turning text prompts into voxel 3D geometry. Here you can see uh, the system rationalizes a series of variations of a single prompt. And one of the limitations uh, of this result is the 3D geometry data set that it's uh, trained on. Um, and so, yeah, you can see this uh, example of uh, of geometric interpolation between two text inquiries. So like a round chair morphing uh, the topology into a rectangular chair. And I think with the recent advances in natural language, language processing, we can imagine that very soon we won't be able to need to type the prompts in the system. Instead, we're just going to speak to the system and it gives us you know, a more rectangular chair or a round chair. Uh, another example of geometric interpolation we can uh, see is from Blank AI, which takes exterior automotive design data and blends that into existing states of a mesh to target states in terms of its labeled relationships. 
And in the challenge of increasing the, the resolution of these models, researchers in the Adobe labs are getting much closer uh, in this paper they uh, propose called DecorGAN to generate high resolution models from low resolution data sets and extract a style code from each synthesized data. On the left in red is a course input, uh, which gets refined and augmented in yellow and that gets transferred as a style code in green. And here is a reverse where we can see style codes applied onto a refined output by the system. And the synthesized data is the top red row and the two different style codes that are applied in yellow uh, are, are below it. And you might start thinking at this point, can't the system eventually upload say Stark's design and transfer the style of the AI chair and claim to be Stark or worse, somebody else at the ease of a few clicks? And I would offer a counter argument to that, that nobody's stopping anybody from, you know, taking measurements of the existing chair and applying it to a new chair uh, manually. So is it the ease of transfer without any skills? That's the risk of AI in this question. Uh, I think it's an open question and a philosophical one, but um, what I do believe is that the AI-based systems don't trans, um, translate culture, scientific, or emotional needs of today that's ever changing in our society. And that uh, continues to be the responsibility of designers. And so for today, our, our work at Autodesk, we're trying to push the manufacturing needs and turn these generations into reality. Where there's always room to add new constraints and new for, in terms of efficiency or sustainability or even style. And it's these constraints that are always evolving for us. And I believe it's in uh, juggling these constraints, but also uh, culture and capabilities that design thrives and that AI follows the designer to make exploring these boundaries uh, easier. So I wish you all good fortune in that exploration and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It was very interesting. Um, we have time for one question. I don't know if any one of you has a question for Arthur or if we have an online question. Nope. Okay. Uh, I have one for you. Uh, that is, uh, can you tell us in which point of the design workflow AI is being very helpful right now? And what kind of future scenario can you imagine? I think that is dependent on what you're designing and in what context you're designing it for. Say, for instance, if you're in a big company uh, that has uh, a history of similar products, like, uh, I don't know, maybe a tool manufacturer, that you can search with AI the past designs of uh, your company's designs. Uh, and maybe even not just search the designs, but the features and do a very efficient way of feature recognition to uh, maybe apply to a new design. Um, I think that's happening, we're seeing that happen today more and more where the, the AI is, is more uh, increasing efficiency in tools. Uh, rather, uh, I think this, this landscape of sparking creativity it's, it's very, it's new. And I think um, there's a long way between the gap of making things more efficient for uh, the existing design process and sparking creativity. I think uh, the tools have yet to mature enough to be, be formally a, uh, a creative partner, a fully creative partner in, in the design process. So I think it's, it's going to happen soon, but uh, today, I think it's, it's more about making things easier to design. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We have time for, a new, for another one, okay. just the last one. Uh, can you tell us if uh, the introduction of generative models in the workflow and the AR, it's also uh, implying a reduction of costs uh, as it happened with uh, any time that we have a new technology? that is lowering the prices of the production. I think you, you get that inherently when you're targeting a reduction of materials. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the answer again is it's based on context. Uh, if, if that's what your, your goal is to reduce materials, you can drive towards uh, a greater efficiency that would eventually lead to cost. 
Um, and I think the example of uh, JPL, the concept lander, you know, we, we reduced the weight and the material much further than their engineers could. And we validated that it was, uh, you know, a, a valid solution. And so I think that there you can see the promise that, you know, the algorithms can actually do things if it's well defined in a, a much higher performing way um, than, than traditional engineers or designers. But it has to be, I think, well defined and also very specific for uh, the algorithms to actually tackle. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you.